une botte. Ok, ça. Uh, sir, I'm starting the session. Good morning or good evening to everyone. I request everyone to welcome to ICSA webinar series. I request Dr. Thwan sir to kindly begin the proceeding. Over to you, sir. Sir? Okay, okay. Please proceed, sir. Invite uh, our president, uh, Professor Tomiyama, to welcome them first. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Noriyuki Tomiyama from Osaka University in Japan. Now, I'm a president of AOSR, Asian, Soci uh, Asian Oceanian Society of Radiology. Yeah, um, we are very uh, pleased to uh, welcome all of you. Uh, AOSR are giving um, uh, several webinars, uh, and also uh, this webinar is also one of them. Uh, today's webinar is about Asia Safe. How do you know? Um, uh, radiation production is so important uh, for practicing uh, radical, um, uh, radical procedures. So uh, please enjoy today's webinar and let's learn a lot about uh, the RL. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tomiyama. Uh, can we go to the screen, please? Yeah, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Quan Hong Ng. I'm the chair of the Asia Save. Uh, Asia Save was set up by the AOSR a couple of years ago. And this series on those matrix and diagnostic reference levels was initiated by Dr. Tanya from Thailand, and she's very enthusiastic in organizing this. So we have a, it's called the webinar series. We have a series uh, monthly, except March, and then we go on to May, uh, where we invite uh, various countries in Asia to share their experience on diagnostic reference levels. And to start off this series, uh, we have Professor Kalpana Kana. Uh, let me just 
introduce her to you, uh, our distinguished speaker. Uh, Kalpana received her MS degree from the uh, Minister of Taxes in Arangand in 1991, and then her PhD in Radiological Sciences from University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, 96. And uh, she joined the Department of Radiology at the University of Minnesota in 1998. And she was certified by the American Board of Radiology in Diagnostic Radiological Physics. And uh, she's currently the professor and director of the Diagnostic Physics section, as well as the program director for the Imaging Physics Residence Program. She's also the chair of the Radiation Safety Committee at the University of Washington. And she's active professionally uh, in AAPM, ACR, ABR, uh, is the Diagnostic Medical Physics Trustee in ABR since 2017. And Professor Kalpana has published more than 70 papers in peer-reviewed journals and has made several scientific presentations throughout her career. Now, let me, on behalf of Asia Safe, Welcome, Professor Kapana Kanal, to speak with us. Thank you so much Kapana, for that please. introduction. Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you also for the invitation to speak at the webinar today. I will just share my slides. Uh, can you all see my slides? Yes, ma'am. Please proceed. Okay. All right. And you will stop my video. Okay. All right. Um, thank you again. Uh, my topic today is uh, to talk to you a little bit about CT dose metrics and diagnostic reference levels in the next 40 minutes or so. I'll start out by uh, giving you an outline of my talk. Uh, why is CT dose, why does CT dose need to be optimized? What are some of the dose metrics that we should be aware of? some dose from common exams, and then we'll move on to talk about diagnostic reference levels and the ACR CT dose index registry. So first of all, why does CT dose need to be optimized? As you can see on this graph below, CT has increased, a number of procedures um, has increased wow. tremendously in the last decade or so. Uh, there are about 80 million CT procedures that are happening every year. Currently, it's now kind of, uh, you know, flattening out a little bit, but there was a steep rise in the last decade or so. And the reason for that is uh, is multiple. First of all, there's been a lot of uh, advances in CT. We, in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, we have hybrid CT scanners, we have dual source CT scanners, and now soon, uh, now we also have photon counting CT scanners. So CT is being used a lot all over the world. And it's very important that we pay attention to the CT dose from these scanners. Here's an example of what happens when you're not paying attention to the dose from the scanner. So here are some cases that I've shown you and I've blocked out the, uh, the pictures to hide the identi identity of these patients. But basically this uh, child over here on the right was exposed many, many times to a CT scanner because of some malfunction and developed uh, skin erythema within a couple of hours of the scan. Uh, this gentleman here, you can see, uh, had lost a lot of hair uh, from CT perfusion scans uh, to detect possible stroke because the technique that was set up on the scanner was incorrect. And similarly for the patient over here on the left. This really caused uh, CT dose to get into the limelight uh, in the media, in front of all the professionals that deal with uh, CT. So before we talk more about diagnostic reference levels, we need to understand how to characterize the dose in CT. So I'm going to briefly talk about the CT dose metrics um, that are available that uh, physicists are very familiar with. And so are radiologists who are looking at the scans um, or who are reading the scans in CT. So this table over here summarizes 
very well all the different metrics that you might hear uh, radiology professionals talk about where CT dose is concerned. I'm not going to mention and talk about each and every one of them. I'm going to just mention a few of them. Um, the first one here I'm going to show you is a CTDI weighted, which is basically the radiation energy absorbed in a phantom. I do not agree with the table where it says absorbed by a patient's body because these measurements are really made in a phantom. And the phantoms you can see are shown here on the left, a big acrylic phantom to mimic an adult body. And a little baby phantom here is more to mimic the adult head or a pediatric patient or a pediatric head. So the CTDI weighted is a measurement of taking, taking one third the CTDI measurement or the dose that's absorbed in the phantom at the periphery as well as at the center. So one third in the center plus one, two third in the periphery to give you what's uh, called the CTDI weighted. And its units are in terms of gray. But what radiologists, physicists, and technologists use more often in daily um, uh, clinical practice when you're talking about CT dose is CTDI wall. And that is an approximate average radiation dose over the X, Y, and Z axis of the phantom. You, you notice I scratched out the word patient because it's not the patient's body uh, that we are getting this dose estimate from. It's based on these phantoms that are supposed to mimic a patient's body. But obviously these are plain acrylic phantoms. It's so far away from a patient's body, right? So you have to be very, very uh, clear when you're talking about these dose metrics that they are to a phantom. And the size of the phantom is extremely important as well, whether it's to the larger phantom or to the smaller phantom. And you'll, you'll see why in a minute. So the CTDI wall is defined as that CTDI weighted that I showed you in my previous slide divided by pitch. Um, and this is what we all use when we're talking about dose and CT. And why is this significant and why am I talking about it? Because this is what we're gonna use the metric to define our DRLs. This is the CT dose metric that we are interested when we look at DRLs. These numbers, as I mentioned, are benchmarks against a phantom, not a patient. And for the same technique parameters, the relationship between the CTDI wall as a function of patient size is given by this equation here. So the CTDI wall, if, uh, if done, um, if, if calculated using the smaller phantom, the 16 centimeter phantom, is nearly two, double or twice that of the larger phantom. So when we talk about CTDI, uh, even though we talk about it in terms of a patient, we need to be sure we know what we're talking about with respect to what phantom size, because your numbers will vary uh, depending on the, on the phantom size. And the other thing we need to be aware of in practice is different manufacturers will display dose either as a function of 32 centimeter or as a function of 16 centimeter. And that's spe especially relevant when you're talking about pediatric doses. The abdomen uh, doses for pediatric might be in reference to a 32 centimeter phantom or a 16 centimeter phantom. So knowing the relationship between the two is extremely important. Here is another demonstration of how the CTDI wall uh, shown here increases 2.6 times as the phantom size decreases. So here is the 32 centimeter phantom. At the periphery, you're measuring a dose of 21.6 at the center, you're measuring half of that. And why is that? That's because of the attenuation of the beam as it's traversing this phantom. So your CTDI wall measurement is about 18. As you go to smaller size phantoms, you can see that the center uh, of the phantom, the dose at the center of the phantom is similar to that at the periphery. There's not much attenuation taking place. And you can see how the CTDI wall is increasing as you're going to smaller size phantoms. So when we have a larger patient, like a 200 pound patient, and say we are uh, talking about the dose to the fetus, yes, the dose might be large, but large to the patient themselves, but it's possible that the dose to the fetus is actually lower and it's a little protected by all that fat uh, that might be there between the entrance of the patient and the middle part where the, where the fetus might be might be. So patient size is extremely important when you're considering the dose uh, from a particular exam. 
On the other hand, dose length product, it's an indicator of the whole irradiated radiation dose for an entire exam. It incorporates a number of scans as well as the scan length. Um, and it really is used more as an indicator of biologic risk. So for example, in the patient above, the CTDI wall is about 20 milligray. There's 10 one centimeter slices and the DLP is 200 milligray per centimeter. Uh, I mean, multiplied by centimeter. And the lower uh, patient over here has is also 20 milligray. But instead of 10 one centimeter slices, you're seeing 20 one centimeter slices. So even though the CTDI wall is the same between these two patients, the risk is actually double because your dose length product is now 400 milligray uh, times centimeters because you have just doubled your scan length. So DLP represents more the greater biologic risk uh, from a scan to a patient. And one easy way, especially for radiologists and technologists to calculate the effective dose if they need to do that, can be to just take the DLP and multiply it by a conversion factor, which is dependent on body part and age of the patient to quickly come up with an effective dose estimate if, if needed. Uh, this is a quick and dirty way to do that. Uh, physicists might uh, do it in a more detailed form by using software to calculate the effective dose more accurately. But if a uh, radiologist is interested, they can use these factors. These are probably not easily accessible, but they can ask the physicists uh, who can provide these K factors to calculate the effective dose. And you can see how the numbers vary depending on whether you're an adult or a child and what anatomy is being imaged. So those are the three factors I just spoke about, CTDI wall, DLP, and effective dose. And again, just keep in mind all of that, uh, the CTDI wall that you're starting at is with respect to a phantom. However, patients are not phantom. So how do you calculate a little bit more specific patient dose estimate? So to get a more specific estimate, medical physicists derived a quantity called the size-specific dose estimate. And what that does is it takes that CTDI wall from the phantom and converts it to a more, maybe I would say not accurately accurate patient dose, but getting very close to an approximate patient dose by multiplying by a conversion factor. And that conversion factor could be based on the patient's habitus. It could be an effective diameter. It could be an AP dimension. It could be a lateral dimension. And you have the APM report 204, uh, which you can then look up these conversion factors and calculate the SSDE. Currently at this time, only the physicists uh, who have access to these reports or uh, possibly radiologists could look this up. But at some point in the future, um, I hope this will also show up automatically on the CT console, along with the CTDI wall and the DLP, giving you a much better estimate of the actual patient dose or an approximate patient dose with this kind of, hab with the habitus, with the wearing habitus. So there are two reports from the American Association of Physicists and Medicine. One is report 204, that talks about the size-specific dose estimate in pediatric and adult body CT exams. And I think this came out around 2014, I believe. And then the size-specific dose estimate from head CTs came out, the report came out around um, 2019. So you can access them from these links that are shown at the bottom of the slide. And just to give you a little uh, flavor for the different dose estimates from CT, uh, at the top part of this table are uh, effective doses from radiography procedures. And at the bottom are some estimates of uh, effective doses from CT exams. So for example, head is close to about two millisieverts and abdomen pelvis is close to about eight millisieverts. And this is something good to keep in mind, especially as physicists, and I also actually suggest the radiologists keep this at the back of your mind when they're uh, looking at exams and if they see something that does not look like it is normal, it's kind of nice for them to also have an idea what the effective dose would be from a particular exam. So in summary about on the CT dose metrics, and I, went, I know I went through this very quickly, but really I wanna focus more on the DRL part of this talk. 
Uh, CT utilization has grown significantly in the last decade or so. It is now reaching a plateau, but we still do about 80 million exams per year uh, in CT. And dose in CT is of course a concern if the scanner is not optimized. If your scanner is optimized, um, then it's not a problem. But as I showed you in those three examples, um, those cases happened and uh, accidents happened uh, is because the dose in those scanners were not optimized or the patient or the technologist didn't know uh, what they were doing. Dose needs to be monitored. Um, this is incredibly important. Uh, we have to monitor the dose from our protocols and what we're giving to our patients. Some of the parameters I discussed for CTDI wall, which is very readily available on the console. Uh, the dose length product is also available on the CT console. Uh, the size specific dose estimate can be easily calculated with the help of your physicist, as well as the effective dose can be calculated um, easily using knowing some of these dose metrics. And I also always uh, tell uh, my residents and my faculty that it is good to keep an idea or at the back of your mind what doses are from typical uh, CT exams. I'm gonna now move on for the next 25 minutes and talk about diagnostic reference levels, which is really the focus of this talk. I will discuss the concept of DRLs and achievable doses. I will give you a brief introduction to the American College of Radiology CT Dose Index Registry. And I'll talk about the two publications that I was involved in uh, regarding DRLs. And then at last, I'll end by giving you a little idea of how you could use DRLs uh, to look at your own practice. So diagnostic reference level was first proposed in 1990 by the International Council on Radiation Protection. And the DRL is typically set at the 75th percentile of a dose distribution from a survey conducted across a wide user base. They are not investigational levels, they're not regulations, they're not even legal standards of care, and they do not apply to a single individual patient. They really apply to really to a patient population. And they are really the main purpose is to identify exams where levels of patient dose are unusually high. So if DRLs are consistently exceeded, so for example, if my dose is say for a head CT is 80 milligray, which is at the, you know, past the 75th percentile of my doses across my practice, then I need to conduct a review of my procedures and equipment to optimize my dose. I am higher than I should be uh, when I exceed the 75th percentile. If not op optimized, you have to take action to reduce your dose. The overriding clinical objective of doing this is to achieve an acceptable image quality or adequate diagnostic information consistent with your medical image task. And that's why you're keeping an eye on your dose. The best reference I can give you for looking at DRLs is the ICRP publication 135. It is really an excellent uh, resource for anyone who wants to learn about DRLs and implement and practice. On the other hand, achievable dose can be used with the DRLs to assist in optimizing image quality and dose. And they are set at approximately the 50th percentile or median of the study dose distribution. What that means is half of the facilities are producing images at lower doses and half are using higher doses. Your goal as a practice should be to be somewhere around the medium, lower if you can justify it or with good image quality or between the median and the 75th percentile. And further information about achievable dose is in the NCRP report 172 if you're interested. So in, in summary of the definition, DRLs and ADs are part of your optimization process. In this graph here, you can see the frequency as a function of dose and your doses, here's the 50th percentile and here's the 75th percentile. And you wanna be somewhere around here. And as you can see over here, most of the studies are below the 75th percentile for this adult head exam. There are a few that are over uh, the 75th percentile. And your goal is to investigate these doses that are over 75th percentile to see why they were high. Most, your ideal situation would be to have doses as much 
close to the median or between the median and 75th percentile. Now, you might be over the 75th percentile sometimes when you have a really, really large patient or, or you just can justify based on what the radiologist is looking for for certain exams um, that, you know, that's a better image quality. Maybe you have an old scanner. Um, as long as you can justify that, um, you should have very few exams that are greater than 75th percentile. It's essential to ensure that image quality appropriate for the diagnostic purposes is achieved when changing patient doses. And this optimization, as I said, has to balance image quality and dose. So it's not always great to have low dose. What you need to have is optimized dose for the type of patient population and for the image quality that you want to achieve. So let's move on and talk a little bit about the American College of Radiology. So the American College of Radiology has called, has a national radiology data registry, which consists of registries for different things. So for example, the dose index registry is for CT doses. The CTC is for CT colonography registry. Uh, the LCSR is a lung cancer screening registry. So it has different registries. But the one I'm focused on today is the dose index registry, uh, which basically is for CT doses. So what the registry does is it's a tool for quality improvement so facilities can review their own doses and optimize their protocol. So the ACR collects and compares your dose information across facilities, and it's fully automated, uses standard methods of data collection and processing, and uh, it it was launched really a long time ago in 2011. And the way it works is you have your CT scanner or PACS, you're sending your DICOM structured dose report to a server, which then anonymizes and strips all your patient information and sends it to a dose index registry database. The data is then analyzed over there and you can access your reports and see how you at a particular hospital or a site are doing compared to like-minded hospitals or sites across the country. They have really uh, advanced a lot in recent years. Uh, I used to be the chair of the registry a long time ago, um, and I was very involved in this. Um, they have now actually introduced interactive reports, which is fantastic. You can go in there into the um, login to, into your uh, DIR um, account, and you can pull up different types of reports that I am showing here. You can see just your aggregate doses. Uh, you can see what your operational reports could be. It's useful for identifying outliers. Uh, you could have a CT dose index reports. You can look at it as a function of age, scanner, exam type, so on and so forth. You could compare between facilities. If there are five hospitals, in your in within your uh, medical system, you could compare the doses for the same exam across the facilities and so on and so forth. So it's a really powerful tool that a physicist can have access to to compare their doses across similar facilities across the country. And we, uh, University of Washington, has been part of the registry uh, since it opened in May 2011. Here's an example of a box and viscous plot that you can go pick the dates, pick your facility, pick the exam type, and you can plot and have at your fingertips what your doses look like, and you can also compare it uh, to other sites in the, in the registry. So it's a really useful um, registry, and I think it's helped a lot of physicists, uh, and in some places, technologists and admins who are involved in it to compare their doses to other sites. So as I said that the registry opened in 2011 and in 2017, I was fortunate to be involved in uh, publishing a paper on looking at establishing diagnostic reference levels for adult um, CT examinations, 10 of them across the United States. And this paper is available in radiology. So we looked at 10 most commonly performed CT head, neck, body exams from about 583 facilities. For the head exams, we use lateral thickness as an ind indicator of patient size. And for neck and body, we use water equivalent diameter. And we looked at more than 1.3 million exams and we figured out what um, 
the median values were the mean 25th and 75th percentiles for the metrics that I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, CTDIVOL, DLP, and SSTE. And then we compared our data to other published data in the literature. So this is giving you, this table shows you the number of exams, and you can see the largest number of exams in the United States are abdomen and pelvis for these 583 facilities, more than, almost 600,000 exams. The next largest is chest, followed um, by head. And this is the data that we plotted or is the results of this paper show you the CTDI wall as a function of lateral thickness for the head. Um, and the blue bar here is the achievable dose, so the 50th percentile, and the red is the 75th percentile. And you can see the dose does not vary too much because the head is not really varying so much with thickness. It's really pretty, pretty, pretty similar doses here. And here on the right is the DLP. We did not plot or we did not publish any SSDE when we did this paper because it had not yet been published. That came out about halfway through our the data uh, collection period that we have, so we decided not to include it in the adult paper. Here's an example for chest, and here, of course, now you're in the body region, so we also plotted SSDE. So the blue is the 50th percentile, the orangish is the 75th percentile uh, CTDI, and then the green and the purple are the SSDE 50th and 75th percentile as a function of thickness uh, of the patient. And on the right here is the dose length product. And for the most part, you can see this should increase as the body habit is increases. And then we had similar uh, results for the uh, other body areas or exams that are shown here. In summary for this paper, we established our diagnostic reference level for an adult head was 57 milligray, for a neck was 20, for a C-spine 28, but we also listed the achievable doses um, in this paper. We compared to other um, diagnostic reference levels in the literature across the world. You can see here Japan, uh, 85 compared to 56 for the DIR. Australia is about 60. Ireland is 58. Canada, 79, so on and so forth. The idea here is that we were not too far off. We are in the ballpark. We are on the lower side, but we are on the ballpark because there are some 60s over here. Uh, similarly, for abdomen and pelvis, our DIR diagnostic reference level was 16, and you can see we had some 15, 16s, 18s, and 25s um, in the literature. Now, you know, when you're comparing, it may not be totally an apples to apples um, comparison because I don't know what UK did when they came up with this DRL. But the point I'm trying to make is that our DRLs are not that far off or the countries are not varying that significantly in their, in their DRLs. And if they are, it has to probably do with the population, right? The population habitus, the population type might be different in different countries. So that was the adult DRLs. Um, when we published that, we got a lot of questions about pediatric DRLs. So we started working on analyzing DIR data from 10 commonly performed exams for peds uh, between 2016 and 2020 on patients that are younger than 18 years, which is what's defined uh, by the American College of Radiology as a pediatric patient. And we did similar analysis of uh, CTDI wall, DLP, and SSTE for each facility uh, that was in the study. But not only we, did we do this by size, but we also did it by age because most practices in the United States have their protocols set up uh, maybe as a function of age. Then there might be some practices that have it set up as a function of size. So we decided to publish both of those analyses. The 50th and the 75, 75th percentiles were also determined. Head exams, we only did age. We didn't do that by size. We, didn't, uh, we had some uh, anomalies in our data because of the nose and the shoulder being in the, in our, uh, in the analysis. So we decided just to have pure uh, by age instead. And body was done by age and size. And uh, this time we decided to use effective diameter. And this paper was published uh, probably about two years, a little bit uh, two years ago. 
uh, also in radiology, uh, where we looked at these uh, type of exams. For the pediatric study, we were actually more than 1.5 million exams compared to the adult, which was about 1.3. Uh, and over here, you can see the most common exam was actually the head exam, which kind of makes sense, right? We see a lot of pediatric uh, exams are due to falls, right? They fell off the crib or they fell off the bed. So a lot of the exams were from head studies, followed by uh, next was looks like abdomen pelvis and then, and then um, uh, looks like the neck and chest. Interestingly, we also found that most of our peds, pediatric patients are scanned in community hospitals across the United States um, and children's hospital, not so much at big academic centers like mine. Uh, it's really the hospitals around, you know, suburbs, uh, rural areas, things like that, that are catering to our, our kids and then children's hospitals as well, like uh, Dr. Brady is at. Um, age groups that we looked at was zero to one, one to five, five to 10, and so on. Uh, but most of the uh, patients in our study were uh, actually really almost an adult, 15 to 18 year olds. But interestingly, uh, most sites that were part of the study did very few exams. And the sites that did more than 100 exams were very few in numbers. That shows, again, the importance of uh, developing pediatric protocols, because these are done far and few in between, and they're mainly done in centers where there may not be a physicist present, and they're mainly done in community hospitals out, out, in, the, out in, the, in the country, maybe. So here are some of our uh, data. The head without contrast as a function of age and you know, uh, nicely shows um, that the dose uh, is going down as you go from an adult, almost adult six to 18 year old to lower to less than one year old. In America, um, a head, a pediatric head uh, age child of six years, their head is pretty much uh, treated like an adult head. There's not much change um, and our protocols from six and above could be similar to that of an adult. So you can see the dose from six to 18, which I'm sure most of the emphasis here was towards the 15 and 18 year olds was 46 compared to the 49 that we had for the adult paper. Uh, but one thing that was very uh, heartening to see is that our doses are lowered as the age of the patient goes down. And similarly here, another example for neck. For abdomen as well as the patient age goes down, you can see the dose goes down as well. And the numbers are much smaller compared to our adult patients. Again, very heartening to see that we are uh, child sizing our protocols to, um, for our little, little patients. Here's an example of showing the dose as a function of the actual diameter of the patient. Uh, which some hospitals and practices do. We don't, we use age, but it's good to have that. And again, as the patient size is getting larger, you can see the dose is getting larger as well. So we provided a bunch of these tables and I'm not showing all of that in the interest of time, um, but you get the idea. And then here is a comparison to other countries. And again, it's a little complicated table, uh, but in, the idea was to see whether we were in ballpark and in most cases we were. So those were the two big papers we did in 2017 and 2021. And so basically we followed this process, right? We, we have all our data in the registry. We calculated the dose, we established DRLs. And now how do we use them? Well, if your own site, you look at your doses, if you're greater than that DRL value that's published, um, you know, you got to look at deep dive into your own techniques and your own scanners and see how you can optimize your protocols. However, if you're less than the DRLs, that means your dose is optimized and then, you know, you, you're fine. But what's critical is you can't just do this once and be done with it. You need to keep reviewing <clears throat> and establishing DRLs every two to three to four years because things change, technology changes, scanner types changes, you know, maybe something new technique comes out. So you have to review this over and over. So we are already overdue for reestablishing the DRLs for the adult paper and the pediatric paper that I just showed with you, discussed with you. 
So at least they're dull paper. The beads is just over two years old. So we probably have another year before we need to replace that. But this should be your process for looking at your own, determining your own DRLs at your site if you want to do that, uh, to, and then compare to, to your data or established data. So how could you use the DR, uh, DIR data? So I took this data from an adult paper and I used, looked at my facility, I'm sorry, for my pediatric paper. And I looked at my facility to see how close I was. And this is for a head exam and I'm okay for the little ones, but you can see I'm a little bit higher uh, for the two to six year old and six to 18 year old. Um, and then similarly for chest um, and then similarly for abdomen and pelvis. Now I'm not significantly higher, but I'm, except for this one. So you need to do like, look at your data this closely and determine, okay, I'm higher. Can I justify that? And I, what can I do to optimize it? Because most facilities are below the 75th percentile. So why am I higher, right? What is different about my practice? So that's how you start. You know, you have to start somewhere and um, comparing yourself to published data or if you're involved in the registry, some kind of registry is a, is a good place to start. You can also draw, uh, draw these own um, box and whisker plots. This is one example from our site and compare it to the DIR data. But if you're already participating in the dose index registry, you don't really need to do this because you can now get interactive reports and you can look at how you're doing, your population is doing with respect to your uh, median doses and the DRL data. Now, and this is great. It's wonderful to participate in the dose index registry, but there are limitations, right? It's a registry. It uses automated data collection process. So everything is happening automatically. But if there's garbage in, that's the garbage that's being used in analysis. So you have to pay attention to what you're sending to the DIR. And there's no clinical images or indication information being submitted. So you're only submitting dose. So you're assuming that your images are of good quality, right? Which again, if I'm looking at dose, you really can't look at it without looking at image quality. So there are two sides of a coin. So that's not being submitted. Exam code mapping, you know, if I'm comparing my head without contrast with uh, Dr. Brady's Cincinnati children's head without contrast, are we both mapped? Uh, you know, do we mean the same exam when we're talking head without contrast? So exam code mapping is a manual process. And if you mess up over there, then that will be reflected in your data. And then the DIR does not collect dose reduction techniques, like are you using iterative reconstruction? Um, you know, things like that is not collected. So I don't know in those 583 facilities, you know, how many of them are using iterative reconstruction to reduce their dose and how many of them are using a four slice CT scanner, which does not have all those bells and whistles. And the terminal and the and the methodology we use was ICRP 135, uh, which, which uses the median doses to develop DRLs. It does not take into account the size and volume of a facility. It gives equal weight whether you're a big academic center like mine or are you a you know a 50 uh, bed hospital down in rural Washington. So it does give equal weight to both our sites. But this work did provide great uh, start in the United States for DRLs and ADs. It was the first work that was published both for our adult paper and our pediatric paper. And it represented a broad representation of geography and practice types across the U United States. Um, and it gave us data not only as a function of age, but also as a function of size for the pediatric patients. And this, this work really enables us to look at our own doses more closely and compare and see how we are doing with respect to, to the rest of the country in terms of our CT exam doses. So in summary, what I talked about was the diagnostic reference levels, which are typically set at the 75th percentile. Remember, these are just investigational levels. It's a trigger for you to investigate if your dose is high. It's not a regulation. It's not a legal standard of care and does not apply to individual patients. So it applies more to your population that you have at your particular practice. It does identify exams where levels of doses are high. And your objective here is to have acceptable image quality for that is consistent with your medical imaging task. 
At the same time, you should also be, be aware of the achievable doses, which are set at the 50th percentile. You want to be closer to that and not close to the DRLs. You want to optimize your doses to be closer to the median. And of course, very important, you want to know where you stand if you don't monitor your doses. So extremely important as physicists and technologists and even radiologists to keep an eye on your doses uh, to make sure they're optimized. And the ACR dose index registry can be used to monitor your own doses. And I believe they do accept sites from across the world uh, to participate in the registry. It's pretty minimal in terms of uh, cost. And they have established DRLs for adults and peds, which now they will keep repeating that process every three to five years to establish DRLs as scanners get more optimized and there are more dose reduction options available. And that's all I had to say in the 45 minutes. I. I know it was really uh, a lot to take, but hopefully you had some take home points that you can use for, to optimize the dose in your own practice. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karnal or Kalpana for the very nice introduction to DRL to the dose matrix, particularly about the National Dose Registry. I encourage the participants out there, please send in your question, your comment to the chat box, and we will respond to you. Uh, to begin with, perhaps uh, one question. Uh, if there are limited uh, medical physicists in your facility, what would you do? What could get this DRL started? Great question. Oh boy, what would I do if I admit it? You know, I think if you have limited medical physicists in your facility, I would try to uh, work more with technologists and maybe pick a technologist who is involved in quality control, which they need to as technologists and kind of recruit them to work with you as a partner to try and help establish and get this process started. Um, I will say from my experience in the United States, even though there are a lot of medical physicists here, you're, you're, the technologist is such a great partner for you. And everything I do with, re, re, with regard to protocols and doses, I work very closely with my technologists, with my lead technologists, or the technologist supervisor. So I would think that that might be one way to start. Another way may be to reach out to physicists across the region. Like if you are in uh, you know, one city and about, I don't know, 100 miles away, there's another physicist, maybe work with that physicist to see how you can help each other out uh, and try and establish, at least come up with processes together uh, to try establish uh, getting started into this process. Hopefully that helps. Thank you. Another question comes in is an uh, interesting uh, question. As we probably know, most radiologists would like to have beautiful images. Uh, well, it's good for the diagnosis, they're confident, uh, but they don't really quite bother with the dose. And mm -hmm. how do you think uh, more radiologists could be interested in uh, radiation dose optimization? How could you motivate them or influence them? I think having a good relationship with your radiologist, um, you know, in, in practice, being visible to them. Uh, you know, you don't want to sit in your office. They don't know who you are, who is Kalpana Kanal. I don't know who she is. You need to be visible. You need to be in the reading room. You need to talk to radiologists, you know, go get coffee and start talking to them about the importance of radiation dose and optimizing radiation dose. I think giving webinars, you know, grand rounds to residents and fellows and talking about such concepts and breaking it down into easy to digest concepts will really help. Uh, you need a partner. I, I can tell you that my job would be much more difficult if my radiologists at my site were not interested in dose optimization. So you really do need to find someone 
who can support you for your, what you're trying to do and encourage change and practice. And I think if no one else, you can start with the head of the department, the chairman or the director of CT, um, go have a conversation with them, show them data uh, that's out there that's published and show them how the doses are in publications versus your doses. And if you're high, it's a really good uh, starting point to start a conversation that look we are higher we need to do something to reduce the dose to our to our patients yeah exactly i think this is what i have been uh, with this to inference related uh, the, the question is i was wondering in the process when you first established the national drl and that's in the united states how difficult it was and how to encourage the hospitals, uh, in particular the administrators, to join this national DRL program? So, you know, we are, um, from my experience, we are, I'm very privileged because, of course, I'm in the United States, which is uh, the hospitals here, most hospitals here have a lot more money than hospitals maybe in, uh, in other parts of the world. So, and dose is such a big thing. When we joined the DIR, when it opened, you know, and I showed you those examples of those patient um, accidents or patient injury, talking about CT dose in the US was the buzzword. Everyone was, uh, CT dose is bad. You need to monitor your dose. So administrators were open to having physicists suggest what to do. You know, let's, yeah, let's do this to monitor our dose or let's do this to optimize our dose. So we were lucky in that respect. Uh, you know, you have to convince your administrator to pay to get involved in registries and things like that. Um, so that's what we did. Um, in terms of places where you may not have the support, again, you have to go convince them. Uh, this is a starting point. Um, if you don't have a dose monitoring program, registry is really a cheaper version of trying to monitor your dose. Uh, and if you're doing things manually, it's a lot more difficult, but you can start somewhere, right? You can take 50 exams, you have 50 continuous exams of a particular um, uh, you know, protocol like CT head, for example, and just look at your doses and plot it out and see how you're doing. But I really think the key is making yourself visible as a physicist, if, if that's what you are, and then partnering with radiologists, convincing administration that this is the way to go. And again, here it's much easier to do that maybe because of uh, all the, you know, the hype about CT dose in the United States. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, I guess United States is in a unique position compared to the rest of the world, uh, it's a very Absolutely. lots of physicists, facilities, and resources. Uh, what happened to uh, many countries in, say, Asia? They really don't have the luxury of diagnostic medical physicists. Uh, well, whatever physicists they have are uh, working in therapy. So what would you do to, so, well, really, to me, yeah. depends very much on the leadership of radiologists. So could you offer some advice? Yeah, so um, I think, again, I have seen that I'm from India originally, and I've tried to uh, network a lot with the physicists in India who are really trying to do things like establishing DRLs. And I think, I think one thing that physicists across the Asian countries could do is reach out, um, you know, to physicists in other countries and maybe have some kind of... Uh, uh, network with them, uh, get resources from them. How can they help um, to start the conversation in India one way or, or in any other country? One way would be like these webinars, right? You invite people, let's talk and okay, now how can you help me? And how can I do this based on my situation and the resources I have? So I think networking and AAPM, which is the American Association of Physicists and Medicine, which have a lot of international members, uh, if you're part of that, that would be great uh, if you can. Um, there is a lot of resources on the website to help you get started uh, with trying to determine how to move forward in establishing DRLs. So I think I totally understand uh, how it is in countries outside the U.S. And um, I think you have to start somewhere and networking, making, uh, meeting other like-minded people in your country uh, to get the conversation going, um, like how 
Pania has worked in, in Thailand and what they're doing with DRL establishment, I think is a good way to start. Thank you. Uh, so in an effort to establish the national DRL, what do you think about the regional DRL for each region of the world? Yeah, I think, you you know, I would normally start small and then go large. So I think if that's a comp if you have limited resources, start with a regional level is really a good way to go. And then maybe expand your, you know, include data from other sites and go to a national level, especially if you have never done it before and you're starting. So taking baby steps and doing regional is good. Uh, regional is also good if you have a certain type of population, maybe your region, there's you know, for example, more obese population or maybe a population that has a certain type of disease that you do a certain type of CT exam. So I don't think it's a bad idea to start region, uh, regional, uh, establish regional DRLs and then move out and, you know, expand by including more and more areas and then establish uh, national DRLs. Also depends on the size of your country, right? If you're a small country, you could just go with national, but if you're a large country, uh, then doing it region-wise might be a good way to start. Uh, okay. I, I think we have different interpretation region here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Uh, uh, what this person asked is region of the world, for example, Europe, North America, so rather than the a region or a a, a different oh. uh, okay. Not districts within a country, in a, a but country, across the yeah? world. Okay, across yeah, the world. I, I apologize. Uh, region of okay, the okay. world. So, for example, I guess you could look at it either way. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, we know there's a European it is very strong. EU mm -hmm. has a regional DRL. How about the rest of the world? Yeah, so you basically, the question was, what do I think about the different DRLs from the different parts of the world, right? Yeah, um, is it also worth to establish or to encourage the formation of that? Encourage the formation of that. I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. Uh, but meaning to establish a regional DRL? Let's say DRL. Oh, okay, so for like in Asia, Europe or Australia. Region. Okay, okay, I see what uh, you're saying. Okay. Yes, yeah. I think it is. I think it is very important to have. Um, I understand the question now. I apologize. Yes, it is very important to do that because your population where you are may be different than the population of a different country. So comparing again, I'm going to say United States would say like Japan, where Japan the people are, uh, you know, more more fitter, not as obese as a U.S. population, their DRLs are going to be totally different than the population here in the United States. So I think it's important to establish regional uh, DRLs. So when you compare, like we did in our paper, I mentioned when I gave showed you that slide that I may not be comparing apples to apples where my population is different than theirs, but just to see, am I in the ballpark? You know, am I uh, similar enough? I'm not uh, higher or different by a magnitude or so. So yes, I think establishing regional DRLs is important uh, because it depends on the type of population, the type of practice you have. Uh, things that happen in the US may not happen in Europe or Asia or vice versa. So it's important to do that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the participants are, who are listening, uh, any question, please? Uh, drop a line in the chat box uh, while Professor Kana will try to answer your question or any comment. Uh, also, please drop in the box as well. Okay. The chat box. Just now received a question from audience. Uh... Share it to your WhatsApp. Uh, there's one question regarding how about the technologies or radiographers? Well, they are very important uh, partner in the whole imaging chain. So how could they contribute to the setting up of the DRL and also to optimize radiation dose to the patients? Oh, that's an excellent question. So I I work very closely with my technologists across all my sites. So one way they can help is, first of all, they can partner with you for a protocol review and changing the protocols. Um, they can partner with you if they if you don't have an automatic dose monitoring program, they can um, 
document the dose for, you know, the same type of exam or, you know, as the patients come and go, they could document that. Um, they can help you with understanding um, why in a, but for a particular exam, it's okay to have a larger dose maybe because depends on what the clinical indication is. I work with my technologists all the time to ask, why did you do this this way? And what is the difference between this protocol and this protocol from a clinical indication point of view and why the dose differences? Um, we are working with our uh, technologists right now in making sure that all our protocol names and our series descriptors are consistent across all our facilities, across all our sites, because then it's easier to group exams when you're looking at doses and trying to establish DRLs. I think technologists are undervalued. Uh, I think they have an amazing um, clinical information that you can uh, partner with as a physicist so that you guys, you can learn both the, you know, from them for the clinical information and you're the one expert maybe on the dose and you can make your uh, doses better. Technologists can reach out to the physicists for uh, setting up information or if you're setting up new protocols, uh, physicists can reach out to technologists for making changes or, you know, there's so many things that we can learn from each other, um, just to mention a few. Uh, to get you started. Okay, thank you, uh, Kapana. There's one question from the Philippines. Uh, if we use the ACR dose index registry, can we have an access or can we check the DRL for the other countries? Oh, so the way the dose index registry works is when you're looking at the data, it is not telling you that you're comparing your dose to Japan or to, you know, to Thailand or India, what it's doing is it's just giving you the dose across the like-minded facility. So if you are a trauma center, it'll show you how your dose is compared to how many of our trauma centers are in the registry. So there is um, no facility that's identified. Uh, when you uh, sign up for the registry, you, you tell them what, type of facility you are, and then no one knows that's University of Washington. You're just one site in the registry. So they will not compare. Um, you won't know who you're being compared to. You'll just know you're being compared to like-minded facilities or similar facilities. The whole confidentiality issue and all that. So they don't, they don't tell you what sites uh, you know, you're being compared to. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think there's all the questions that uh, are from our participants, and we like to thank uh, for those who are attending this first of the webinar series. We also thank uh, Professor Kabana Kanal for this introduction on the DRL, the those matrix and the registry. Uh, and Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, the we have the next webinar coming up, uh, February twenty fourth by Dr. Samuel Brady. Uh, continue on the DRL and how we can establish it from the dose management system. Okay, uh, we send out the announcement. So it's February twenty fourth. Right. Uh, at the same time. So uh, I pass it uh, to the uh, the team to give a few announcements. Yeah, okay. Uh, we uh, will be able to send you the certificates, but you have to fill up the feedback form. So could you stand, scan this QR code, right? Uh, and give us your feedbacks regarding this webinar, and we will very much appreciate that. Okay, with that, uh, thank you once again, and uh, wish all of you to have a, a blessed weekend and good health to all of you. See you the February 24th, right, the next webinar. And thank you, Kabana, thank you, 
uh, the team, uh, with Doctor and the rest of you. Ah, okay. This, this is the Friar, February 24th, right? How to establish the national DRLs using those management systems. So we'll be seeing you then. Okay. Cheers for now. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Shall we conclude the session, sir? Yeah. Uh, stop broadcast, please. Okay, sir.